Welcome to The Non-Writer, where I've been exploring the avant music in my record collection and maybe yours too. I'm Rick Reese, and today I'm talking with Wharton Tears. Wharton was part of the uh, New York no-wave scene back in the late 70s, and we're going to be getting into that a little bit later. But first, I thought, uh, Wharton, that you and I would talk a little bit about what you've been doing with uh, Fun City Studios. This has been, uh, you've been doing that for, for quite a while. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Fun City? Well, Fun City uh, started in the basement of the building I was the superintendent of. <laughs> and uh, it was very much uh, do it yourself. You know, um, I had worked in recording for years, so uh, I was able to get some gear and uh sonic youth first band in wow <laughs> pretty much i was still wiring up the mics when they showed up so so you knew you obviously knew them through your uh bronca you were playing with bronca and so were some of them that's right uh glenn and i played together in theoretical girls so um i met all them post that period of time but so was this like their first studio recordings um, I believe it was their first studio recordings. Um, there, there was also an EP that they did that may have been done first. I, I, you know, it's so long now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that, that, that one struggles to remember everything clearly, but uh, but we're like talking '82 or something like that. It was definitely their. It was yes. It was definitely their first album. Okay. I, yeah, I can say that for for certain. Uh, they they may have released an EP before that, but and you were already friendly with them, so it was probably a fairly relaxed session. Would you say? Yes, I I'd say uh, it was definitely very relaxed. Although of course they they were a little nervous because I was putting the studio together, so uh -huh. <laughs> they weren't quite sure what they were going to get out of that. And uh, you know, I I guess I was nervous too because it was really the first you know, real band that I was trying there, although I had done a lot of my own stuff. So so um, were they were they already signed to a label at this point? Um, that record came out on Neutral, which was Glenn's label at the time. Oh, OK. All right. So neutral, it's very, neutral, right? very neutral, independent. Right. <laughs> yes, it was all very independent. Right. And uh, I think Thurston did most of the PR for the record. Right. Because I think he was working. He was working at Neutral at the time. Okay. <laughs> She's in a bad mood. And you're still doing Fun City today, is that right? Well, I, I still have a studio here in uh, Pennsylvania where, okay. I'm, where I'm now living. Um, and it, it's basically, you know, it's all the studio equipment from Fun City and, and any of the other um, stops along the way. Um, I stopped using Fun City as the actual studio name um, when I left 22nd Street in Manhattan. And I had gone out to Brooklyn and lived there for 10 years. and um, basically had a control room in, in the apartment I was in and also a, a shared studio space with some friends. Um, and now I'm up in Pennsylvania. So it's, it's all basically uh, disassembled, but somewhat assembled in the basement. Right. <laughs> that, but, that, but, that, but for, upcoming project. For all these decades, you've basically been doing uh, recording projects Yes. Yeah. And you also have your own ensemble, right? Um, yes, I have my own ensemble to 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 play with. Um, 
in, in terms of a live uh, collaboration. And I, I also, you know, do kind of, I would call them one-off uh, sound discs or, you know, I had an all synth band. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so. Um, well, how many instruments do you play? Well, um, I can play keyboards, guitars, and drums, I think fairly competently. Okay. <laughs> the rest is all just having fun. Um, right. But, you know, I've been writing symphonic things using the keyboards to, to emulate the sounds. And, uh, you know, at some point, I hope to get an orchestra to actually play the stuff. So uh -huh. that's, kind of, that's kind of an upcoming thing. <laughs> right. All right. Well, getting back to uh, the Fun City Studios days, there were a couple of bands I saw on the list. That okay. I w I really wanted to hear about, of course, Sonic Youth. Uh, but uh, one of one of uh, my favorite metal bands from the '80s and '90s, and actually they're still around today, uh, is Prong. Uh, yep. So you must have been doing one of the first Prong recordings in a studio. Can you tell me a little about that? Well, um, as I said, Tommy Victor w worked at CB's. He, he knew a little bit about sound and things. And um, I had worked with uh, Ted Parsons, the drummer, in another band called Cabbages and Kings. Okay. And I think he, he was very pleased with the drum sound I got and, you know, probably suggested that that was a good place to record. Okay. And, um, you know, like, probably most of the records I was doing then, it was really probably like a five day event. Uh-huh. Well, five <laughs> days is, that's pretty good for, uh, you know. That's, that's very good. good. Yeah. My friend used to call it the punk rock special. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was, you know, I mean, a couple days, the, the, these bands had all, you know, rehearsed the material and it played out and everything. So that they, they knew basically what they were doing. And they would come in for a couple of days and we'd do live tracks with everything. Right. And then usually a day to fix stuff up and uh, another couple of days to mix. And it was done. And what was Tommy Victor like to work with? Um, Tommy was very uh, intense and, uh, you know, a great guitarist. He knew exactly what he wanted. Um, he also uh, turned me on to Charvel guitars. Okay. Um, Sam Ash had been running a special, and they they had these uh, Charvel models on sale for like ninety nine dollars. Uh -huh. And he said, "Great guitar! I bought three of them, you know." And I, I said, "Okay, well, I'll go try it out." And I I love the way it felt, and I bought it. It's still one of my favorite guitars. So, yeah, yeah. I met Tommy briefly after a prong show here in San Francisco. And I just had to shake his hand and let him know that I thought he was like the hardest working guy in metal because, uh, you know, the, 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 the way he's been able to keep prong going and all the other bands that he's worked with, um, he, he just is nonstop. Uh, well, you, I think in the music business, you have to be driven. You know, it's, yeah. it's how driven you are certainly is, is part of the element, you know. Sure. Yeah. And Tommy sure seems driven. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, another band that people may not have heard of <laughs> that I uh, that I really love is Borbito Magus. They're better known in the New York area, um, but I should let you know that I uh, brought them to the West Coast uh, to do a show out here. And uh, for those of you who don't know Borbito Magus, uh, they're, they uh, <laughs> they're incredibly loud. A sax duo, and uh, sometimes they had a guitar also, sometimes they didn't. No drums, um, and it was just amplified to the max, and it created this really unusual sonic texture in whatever space they were playing. And the gig that we did here was at a nice theater, 
and they blew up my amp, smoke and everything. <laughs> So tell me about how do you record a band like Orbito Magus? Well, they were actually, I mean, they're they're all great musicians. Um, I don't remember them being particularly loud in my studio, but I did a lot of loud bands like Swans and Sonic Youth. Yeah. So, you know, I, I the, the volume wouldn't have been the thing. Um, you know, it's, it's all kind of mid-rangey, and that's uh, part of the... the the interaction i think with right the whole, you know it's it's in that central space um but my my studio i probably just separated them out as far as i could get them and then did everything live i mean i don't remember doing a lot of overdubs with them um but again the, the, i recorded them a long time ago um it may have even been eight track <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> Well, so that, that would have been that would have been the early days of Fun City, the eight track reel to reel. Yeah. Um, well, how many tracks do they need? <laughs> well, I mean that, that that's why. I mean, I don't remember doing any overdub. I think it was mostly a, a live rendition, you know, which would would be, I think, where they uh, they live anyway. So um, I just remember the horn players, like sometimes picking up a couple horns each. So they would create all these weird uh, tonalities and octaves and things within, you know, uh, two players. They were really creating the, the sound of almost like four horns. Well, yeah. One of their favorite things to do live would be to drop the microphone into the bell of the saxophone and then put the two saxophone bells together yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just wail. Um, did they do that in the studio? I can't believe that they did. Um, you know, I, I think that that probably would have been, you know, a, a little hard to capture <laughs> <laughs> yeah. on, on the tape, you know, w without it shrinking down to the point where, where yeah. it doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. Well, yeah, for, you know, I mean, that's the whole thing with tape, you know, there, there is a, there is a headroom. Sure. But for, for music like that, too, you really want to get the room sound, you know, as along with the instruments. Well, I, I was always a big user of room mics. So, I mean, even though it was probably maybe an eight track recording, I, I would imagine that there were at least a couple room mics there, a, a mic or two on the guitar and, and then a mic for each of the horn players, you know, minimally. Right. And then it's how close they are to, to the mics, you know, in terms of what kind of feedback they're getting and that's about as much as i remember sure. <laughs> i did see them several times though <laughs> So that was back in your earlier days in the 80s. Yeah, when um, that record was done, definitely. Yeah. It was in the 80s. Uh, a little later on in the 90s, you would uh, get some pretty good success. Gold record with uh, Helmet. That's right. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, that was, uh, that was the, my exposure, I guess, to, to big record companies. Uh -huh. <laughs> um. And Helmet, I I had recorded their first record. Um, I knew Paige again from Glenn. Uh -huh. he, played, he was playing with Glenn Bronco for a while. Okay. Um, he was interested in having me record, and you know there was virtually no budget. I mean, they were basically just starting playing. Um, but we did, uh, you know, probably the punk rock special, five days. <laughs> <laughs> the album came out everyone liked it and you know they got signed to interscope uh to, to the to, you know million dollar contract uh-huh and uh so i guess i was in the running to make the record and ended up doing it um huh so did you take a little more than five days for that next one well <laughs> 
Yes. I mean, partly because they, they wanted a lot of mixing done on it. You know, yeah. but do you remember um, who the producer was for that? Well, I, I'm technically the producer of that record. Oh, all right, great. Well, yeah, they they had agreed to that. Easier. They had agreed to that when the record came out. That the credits didn't read like that, and that that created a little bit of a skirmish. But uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so there was among, there among was, some other fine details. But it, it doesn't matter. It's a great record anyway. Yeah, sure. And they didn't have a, another hired producer that you had to deal with. So no, you know, I mean, and 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 dealing with record companies. I mean, I, which I did on you know a regular basis around that time. Uh -huh. uh, it takes a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, in in a way, I, I always preferred. I would look back fondly on the old days with the bands coming in and you know spending a week or five days and uh -huh. on to the next one. You know, right? And it's it's easier to make five people happy than you know fifty. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's the. The live and learn. All right. Save the kill. It all comes back. Stick it out. Waste my own attack. Lift me up. Do what I found. Bite my lip. I'm far down south. Well, and then you mentioned this other band that that you uh, worked with, also uh, in the kind of in the metal. <laughs> this Biohazard. More Biohazard. Stuff. Yeah, Biohazard. Tell us about Biohazard. Well, Biohazard. They they were very authentic. Uh, they struck me as very authentic Brooklyn. They were they were kind of like Brooklyn's version of Helmet in in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, they uh, the, the lyrics were all kind of like dumb but very smart at the same time uh -huh. <laughs> slightly humorous even I, I don't know how to describe it exactly but um yeah and they were very intense they were very intense guys in fact they uh were all uh have, having psychiatric uh treatment together <laughs> oh. <laughs> in, in order to keep the band together i think Oh, kind of like a Metallica, some kind of monster thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, they were they were ahead of the Metallica in that regard, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, but they didn't do but, a documentary about it. <laughs> no, well, they didn't do a documentary about it. Although that band would be very interesting to do a documentary about. And they had some some really hardcore fans in the New York City area. And uh, you know, the I had already done the record when I I went and saw a show that they did. And it, it always struck me like the, the rites of spring, but in the most primitive sense imaginable. <laughs> uh, you know, there were a lot of people in that audience that were, were suddenly afraid to be there, I think, once, <laughs> once the show started. Great. Well, wow, this is a fantastic endorsement for the album. I, I got to go look this up. Well, you should you should check it out. I, I, I think it's it's they're, de they're definitely and I, I think the record I did with them is probably one of their best. But Do you remember the name of it? Um, I can I can find out and, and give it to you. But how about the I, year roughly? The year yeah. would have been 93, 92. OK, 93. around the same time as the helmet then. Yeah, no, they they were they were part of a whole chain of of, of uh, things that happened right in that period of time. Okay, you know, and um, we we had agreed to do the record in three weeks, and at the end of three weeks, I was supposed to go away on vacation uh -huh. for a couple of weeks. Something I I desperately needed at the time after all the record companies and bands and everything. Right, and uh, the record, of course, ran over uh-huh so i got to to stay in new york another week with them but um it, it was it was an, quite the experience and uh what was the name of that record well did you go on to do more with them later no i never did um okay. you know they, they they moved on to bigger and better producers i guess in the music uh -huh. business. Sure. although as i said i i can i can say that that's one of their better records the one I did. all right well, I'll have to check it out. It's a 
And last but not least, of your credits at uh, Fun City Studios, you did the Priceline ads with William Shatner. Now, uh, you got to tell us about that. Well, I, what I did was I mixed the, the sound for those. Okay. Um, the, the ads were all shot uh, ahead of time. You know, some, someone else had done all that. And apparently they had done a mix of it and had given it to the people at Priceline. And I guess the comment was, it doesn't seem live enough for whatever. So um, they called me in <laughs> to correct that. Uh huh. So it wasn't actually done at Fun City. We, we did it at a commercial jingle house somewhere in Manhattan. Okay. Um, and did you work with William Shatner at all? Well, he, he, he did show up. Uh, I mean, his, his stuff was all pre-recorded. He did show up, but it was, it was, it took about a day or two. I, I, I remember mixing all the different, uh, you know, tracks and then it was exciting having it all come out and it, it it's still looks like the most off the cuff <laughs> commercial ever released on TV, which is kind of interesting. We got a great big convoy rocking through the night, yeah. We got a great big convoy. Ain't he a beautiful sight? Can you see it, mister? An army of Priceline.com users fit in strong. Saving our own price for airline tickets, hotel rooms, and more. We're saving a truckload of cash, good buddy! You coming along for the ride? We're gonna roll this trucking convoy across the USA! Convoy! What all of these things have in common, or many of them anyway, um, and besides me, <laughs> besides you, well, you know, the thing about you is that uh, you worked with a lot of bands and were in a lot of bands that played really loud, dense music. And we're going to get into the work with Glenn Branca uh, um, in a minute here. But you, because of that, um, when you started recording this music, um, this must have become kind of a specialty of yours, probably why you got hooked up with these uh, <laughs> loud, dense uh, bands later. But record I know recording that kind of music uh, is very difficult. Can you tell us what are some of the challenges in doing that? Well, I mean, the challenge is to get it to sound like something coherent at the end of the day. Uh <laughs> right. Um, and you know, that, that leaves it wide open, I guess, you know, because then you, you can actually get away from, from strict musicality with a loud band where, where you're just creating screeching sounds or, or feedback going into something else. I mean, it's not technically considered music. It's, it's more like electronics uh -huh. or, or just, you know, soundscape. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I, I had an experience I, recording loud things all the time. I mean, my first experience recording with a, a, an engineer was when he came in and told everyone that I was playing with that we all needed to turn down. <laughs> that that's not how records are made. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, you know, we probably did turn down uh, at that point, but you know, I always remembered that. And it's, you know, to me, I mean, the, the, the gauge to me is like a live performance. Right. You know, bands that can pull something like that off live and have it work should be recordable, you know, if, with the right techniques. Right. And so you managed to uh, come up with those techniques pretty much uh, on your own. Well, uh, I guess I did come up with my own a little bit, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I had recorded things for years and, and years. Um, my father sold tape recorders. So, oh, I, you I know, see. I had tape recorders as a kid when it was still fairly arcane technology, you know. Right. 
And, you know, I realized that you can, you can really slam tape very heavily um, and still have it respond in a way that, that, that works. Right. Um, so were you, were you, you uh, arrived in New York in 1976. Were you doing recording before that? Um, yes, I would say I recorded before that. Um, okay. I, I went to uh, college and spent most of my time at the college radio station where, oh, right. where I was in charge of production, which basically meant I got to record everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I always did that kind of stuff. All right. So tell us how you end up going to New York in 76. Well, uh, th that also involved uh, college, I guess, because I, I, I met a girl there uh, when we were both doing theater and uh, she wanted to go study in New York. And I said, yeah, New York sounds like a good place to go and check out, you know. So, so you went for theater. Well, I, I went I, I was actually writing at the time more than playing music right at that time i was writing a lot and i thought well i'll go to new york and write or, or whatever but of course i got to new york and and the music scene was happening and i'm like well i can always write when i'm older and i'll just go play music now <laughs> so, so up, up until then were you very had you been to new york before were you very familiar with it uh, i'd only been to new york a couple times i mean i grew up in philadelphia and um, you know Philadelphia is a fairly large city as well, so there, there are a lot of similarities there, although th there was a lot of differences as well. I mean, the image people have of the mid to late 70s New York City is a grim one. Um, did it look that way to you? Yeah, I, I, I would say parts of the city definitely looked like a bomb went off. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there, were, there was lots of abandoned housing. There was lots of trash. There were lots of dark alleyways, and there weren't. Well, it doesn't seem like half the amount of people that are there now. Sure, and you uh, know, so, which means the streets, rather than being filled with people, are kind of empty when you walk around. <laughs> it's yeah. a very different kind of vibe, you know. Uh, when I moved there, you know, Soho was just being populated by artists, and, and that's was, the that's the district you moved to right away. Um, well, I was I was living near uh, Gramercy Park, um, just north of the uh, Lower East Side. Okay, and th and that's where I spent my time in New York and and Haddon anyway. And did you start going to see bands at clubs right away? Um, I have to think that I probably did. I mean, I was I was, you know, very interested in music. I certainly, the first place I I found in the neighborhood was the local record shop. <laughs> All right. Do you, do you remember what that was? Uh, the, the name of it? Because there is a there is a record shop uh, from that area that turns out to be very important uh, in the uh, story we're going to tell later about uh -huh. the, about J the Gomelsky Zoo Festival. And that record store was called Pantasia. Do you remember that name? Mm, I can't think that that was the one, but I, I'd i have to look that one up as well. I mean, sure. it's so long ago. I just have fond memories of the place. And it, it, it didn't let, it was one of the first things out of the neighborhood. Right. Uh, after I was there. But th there was a guy that worked there that I believe played for one of the bands. Well, Cliff Coltrary was a guitar player with, with Bill Laswell. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the zoo band, which would become mm -hmm. material. And he right. worked, he worked at Pantasia and he Pantasia, no, Pantasia was on 23rd street, right? In there, were two, there were two of them actually. One was on the North, one was on the North side of Manhattan and one was in the South. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that wasn't the one that was I'm referring to that was near me. Um, but I know the one you're talking about because uh, one of the members of the Willies worked there okay. on 23rd street, right before they closed. Uh -huh. All right. All right. So you're going to record stores and you're going to clubs and you start meeting musicians. Well, I decided, I decided at that point that I, I would play drums uh, and, and try and get into a band. I see. You know? 
And um, so, you know, the, the resource was the village voice ads in the village voice. So I would start calling people up uh, and, uh, you know, checked out any number of bands. <laughs> sure. But you had not played drums up to that point. No, no. I, I, I mean, I would say I, was, I started out as a drummer. Well, I started out as a lead singer, but that, that, that scarcely counts. I started out as a drummer as far as playing music. Before, before you got to New York? Yes, in Philadelphia. Okay. All in right. Philadelphia. I, I was already playing with, with bands. We, oh, we okay. Stones covers and Beach Boys and Grateful sure. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So who are some of the first uh, musicians you hook up with and make a band? Well, I mean, the, 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 really, it was theoretical girls ah. would, have, would have been the, the, the all the absolute first because they put an ad in the Village Voice and they said, to you know, experimental band looking for drummer. And I forget the rest of it. It was kind of a classic, like one line. I thought, oh, this sounds interesting. So I went and checked it out and uh, I was in the band. <laughs> was there an audition? Yes, I went and auditioned. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I took my drums down and they, they said, you're in the band. And I, we, we sat around and we talked for a while. And uh -huh. I, I came back home and I, I, I'd left the drums there because they said, it's late. You know, we're, we're going to rehearse this week anyway. You can just want to leave the drums here. And of course, then afterwards, I got completely paranoid. Like, these guys are just going to sell my drums. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be it. But yeah, such was New York know, City in those days. Such as New York City in those days, but yeah. they all turned out to be great friends of mine. So. Well, tell us who all those people were. Well, um, there was uh, Jeffrey Lone. And uh, Jeff uh, w was into all kinds of different art. And music, he had studied music for a while, I believe, at some point um, back in the day. But he professed to be a Beach Boys fan and then got totally blown away when he went and saw the Dead Boys. <laughs> yeah. And he saw the Dead Boys. And he said, well, now I have to start a, a rock band. Right. You know, and he hooked up with Glenn Branca, who um, I guess at the time had also come to New York to do some theater or something and liked the idea of playing or whatever. I guess so they hooked up on a few different levels. And uh, Margaret DeWeese um, was Jeff's girlfriend for a while. So I guess that, that got her into the band. Uh -huh. And uh, I was the drummer. So, uh -huh. so that, that was the, the core of the band, you know. So is this uh, three guitars and a drummer? Um, well, we had the configurations changed with theoretical girls almost from song to song. Okay. Um, there was always a guitar, sometimes two guitars. Uh, okay. There was usually a bass part, uh, mostly played on a string bass, but sometimes played on keyboard. Okay. And sometimes it was a keyboard in addition to one guitar, bass, and keyboard. Right. Um, as the drummer, I was the only consistent <laughs> element in that band. Okay, so, so it, le it led to some uh, memorable pauses between songs and live performances. While the, people the audience, switched instruments, yes, everyone was switching instruments, and the audience be would become very impatient and start, you know, getting very uh, angry. <laughs> yeah, you don't want an angry New York crowd. <laughs> well, in, in a way, in a way, it's 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 all kind of a challenging thing, you know. And I mean, that's that's where the volume plays into all this as well. I think. Right. You know, sometimes the volume is, is just the challenge to the audience. Yeah. You know, it's you're either part of the club or, or you go home. Right. <laughs> so, so so when you when you formed this band, Theoretical Girls, mm -hmm. um, how long had you been in New York at that point? Uh, that would have been w within my first year of being there. OK. So that, that all happened in the first year. Right. You know, I spent most of my time the first year looking for a job, <laughs> not surprisingly. Sure. But um, I mean, the good thing was the rent in those days. I think the rent was two hundred and twenty dollars or something a month. Yeah. So, you know, 
not like not like today's New York. Sure, sure. Um, so we're talking '77, sometime in '77 now. Um, you do some rehearsing, and how soon are you guys gigging? Um, we played CBs almost. Well, I, our our first gig was at Phil Niblock's Loft. Phil Niblock was a downtown uh, composer, okay, and a uh, wonderful horn player. And he had a loft space, and he would have uh, you know concerts or for one of a better word. <laughs> Can events. you tell his name again? Phil Niblock. Okay. And and Phil, um, you know, would sponsor these events. And theoretical girls played there probably 10 days after I joined the band. I see. So did they already had songs when you joined? Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, um, Jeff and Glenn had, had both written a handful of songs. Okay. So, and, and they had played with other drummers before I joined the band. Right. You know, it was, probably, it was probably a couple shows here, a couple shows there, but. Yeah. All right. Um, and then uh, in 1978, Giorgio Gomelski comes to New York and he starts uh, hooking up with avant-garde or avant musicians, progressive musicians. He had just been uh, spent, he had just come from Europe where he was working with uh, Magma and David Allen uh, in Gong. Gong, yes. And, um, and he has this vision for starting a new record label called Zoo and, do, and basically producing shows under the zoo banner. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember when you may have first run into Giorgio Gomelski? Well, the first time I would have met him would have been at the zoo festival. Really? That was the very first time? I think that was the first time I met him. Um, because, I, you know, I, at this point, I'd been in New York for two years. Um, I, I knew of Giorgio only because of the Rolling Stones connection. <laughs> right, but, which was brief. But, it was a brief, uh, he briefly brief. managed the Rolling Stones, right. He was better but, known for the Redbirds. Glenn, Glenn was, was much more in touch with all the uh, European avant-garde music, like Gong and everything. So that, that was his connection. I see. All right. Um, but you guys so, were not one of the bands that was rehearsing at Gomelski's place. No, we, we had the luxury of rehearsing at Jeff Lone's loft on uh, in Soho. Okay. He had an entire ground floor, which was big enough to have a whole set of bleachers in there. Uh huh. Wow. And and I think he was paying two hundred dollars a month. Uh huh. Yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah. Uh, it was it was a great place to rehearse, and of course we could just right. leave everything there, so there was no breakdown or other people coming in. Although. Occasionally, I think he did have jam sessions and whatnot. Right. But. Yeah. So this uh, zoo festival, which was actually called the Zoo Manifestival, mm -hmm. because everything with Giorgio was a manifesto of some kind. Um, this happened in October of uh, 78. By this point, you've been playing with theoretical girls for probably about a year. About a year. And the scene that would become tagged the no wave scene had uh, already pretty much happened. Um, famously, uh, Eno also comes to New York in uh, early 78 and ends up uh, recording some of these no wave bands on the album, No New York, which gets released, I believe in the spring of 78, somewhere around there. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about all that activity that was going on that eventually would get labeled no wave? Well, the, the no wave group of bands was really like a collective more, you know, and, and what defined it, I guess, were the rough edges on everything. Uh huh. But it, it seemed like there was a lot of different approaches to the music, if you if you analyze each one of the bands, sure. 
Um, yeah, see, like the only thing people from that scene have often said, the only thing that we had in common is, was that we were all different. <laughs> well, and I, I guess that was part of it. We, we, you know, none of us fit comfortably into into what they would have, I, I guess, it would have been new wave or punk rock. Right, right. Or, or in a way, probably we didn't really want to be identified with that, figuring that, you know, most music, trends last only about a year anyway right until there's something else so we wanted to be that next thing so i, I guess that's how the no way thing came up with and then of course there were a few events where a bunch of the bands participated so then it became you know a convenient tag um for the soho news or whatever to write about right so that yeah. helped i guess solidify it you know and also, it was some, it was something new and different sounding at the time. Um, well, it, yes, because I mean, the punk it, thing had just really almost run its course by then, and uh, the new wave thing was becoming pop. Um, and, and so, I'm sure in New York, people wanted to write about this because it was different. Um, yeah, I think that, that may have had something to do with the, the fascination. Um, I, I, I guess there was, you know, there were a lot of people coalesced into it, which also meant that there was a lot of reach. So, I mean, the, the, the events were always, uh, you know, it was like going to a family party or something. You, you would know the people from the different bands and you'd sit around talking and then their friends would show up and your friends would show sure. up. Yeah. You know. Yeah, well, speaking so, about that, um, so you're playing in Theoretical Girls now for a while, and you're meeting all these other musicians, so you're probably playing with other musicians, too. And the one that comes to mind, of course, is uh, Reese Chatham, because Reese and Glenn kind of pioneered this uh, guitar army sound together. Um, can you tell us a little bit about working with both of them? Well, um yeah, I you know I know them both really well, and uh -huh. I I think they're very different people. Sure, but but they do like masked guitars, both of them. Yes, they do. <laughs> seem to to enjoy that aspect. But they both um, came at it from a totally different uh, perspective. Uh, Reese being kind of uh, avant-garde academic almost. And Glenn being coming from a theater background, so maybe more visceral approach to the music. Would you say that's a fair assumption? Or a... yeah, I, I think that uh, Glenn was always a little more visceral <laughs> than music. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Reese, Reese's music is is slightly more cerebral. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think that that holds true. I mean, I I think you know Jeff Lone had a little bit to do with all of this too. Oh yeah, sure. Sure. Jeff, Jeff was the one that actually started writing pieces for theoretical girls that needed or actually ideally would have more than even two guitars. Right. And and Reese actually played, I believe, one of the parts when, when we went into a recording studio to try and record that because he Jeff wanted three guitars at the same time. So are you telling and, me that at least for a brief period, Glenn, Reese and Jeff played together it, uh, yeah for at least uh, a brief period yes oh, okay and 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 jeff being the uh, ultimate loner or outsider you know w wouldn't play in anybody else's band really oh I mean, he, he he pretty much had to be doing what he was doing or huh you know well, he, I, I don't think he ever performed with anybody else and he's Not, the one who had that great rehearsal space right yes he did Okay. And he would have concerts there. I mean, in a way, he was not unlike uh, Giorgio in that he was would promote a lot of events, you know, of uh -huh. all different kinds, you know, uh, because he knew a lot of the artists. I mean, everyone in in Soho at that point was hanging out at night at the same two bars. And um, so there was a lot of intermeshment. So, you know, there were events happening all the time down there. And, uh -huh. and that's that was part of the reason. I think also the, the no wave flourished because we we weren't 
100% reliant on CBGBs or Maxes, which are really the only two clubs to, to book us on a you know continual basis to have things happening all the time. Right. Yeah. So I, I noticed one other band that you were involved with at the time um, that we haven't mentioned so far, and it was called A Band. How did that uh, fit into this? Well, A Band uh, was Paul McMahon, who played with Glenn in uh, Daily Life, and myself. Um, basically, he wrote half the songs, and I wrote half the songs. Uh, we got uh, bass players uh, and drummer. We were playing for about, I guess the band was together for about two years. And, and we did a lot, we, we played a lot of gigs and we would do, uh, you know, like week long stretches at different, you know, art spaces and things like that. Uh -huh. um, Cindy Sherman was our hat check girl. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just part of the in, involved nature of everything, I guess. And what year was going on at the time? So, so yeah, what, what year are we talking about with a band? Um, I was still in theoretical girls when I started that a band. So, um, I'm guessing that uh, the time frame would have been 70, late 78 or early 79 to yeah. maybe 81. Yeah, because I noticed a band did not play the zoo fest, the zoo mana festival. No, uh, we weren't, we weren't together by the time that came along. Yeah, okay. And that would have been October of 78. So. And we probably wouldn't have played the Zoo Fest anyway, because a band was not really a very experimental band. It was it oh. was more like going back to a punk rock band. I or, see. Or, or some time, kind of punk rock meets no wave. Uh-huh. Sure. Kind of, kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I, although there was an arty component, I mean, and, and, and Georgia loved my music later. So he, he did come see the ensemble a few times when we played oh good yeah uh, and so, uh, so this would have been uh after the the zoo festival you're saying uh giorgio uh would come out and see you play yes yes but it was the ensemble stuff so that would have been in the night in the late 90s I guess. oh well that's great that uh, he stayed in touch with you over the years like that well, we, we saw each other off and on, you know, and then there were huge swaths of time, of course, where we didn't see each other. Right. Which was, was probably right. You know, I think, I mean, my recollection about having, getting Georgia to come see me the, the, when I had the ensemble together is we were playing at the cooler and I just ran into him somewhere, uh, either loading stuff in or whatever. And I said, uh -huh. you know, we're playing tonight. You should come by. And I, I think he may have even brought David Allen to one of the shows. Oh. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, get, so getting back to David Allen. Um, yeah. George you know, Zoo Manifesto. Yeah. The, man, the Zoo Manifesto. Uh, so. Giorgio has been in New York for most of 78. And uh, now he wants to put together this festival. Um, and he, he's met a lot of musicians like yourself. Um, do you remember how you got invited to the festival? Um, I believe Glenn did that. Okay. Um, you know, with theoretical girls, we all we all would uh, take turns getting gigs. Sure. <laughs> and so, you know, depending on who we knew or what was going on. So. So Glenn had the connection to Giorgio mostly at that time. Yeah, I I, I think, like I said, Glenn Glenn was into to all the avant garde coming out of you know Europe, right? Always. Right. Uh, so he would have been, you know, known that these people were playing and probably went over and, and you know, met with Giorgio and said, we should, you know, you should have theoretical girls. Well, Giorgio had this relationship with uh, David Allen that went back a few years and he brings David from France to New York and wants to showcase him with a New York backing band, uh, which would include Bill Laswell. And that's gonna be the headline. One of my favorite bass players of all time. Sure, a lot of people, yeah. And- uh, I used to love watching him play bass. Yeah. As, as a drummer, it's like, ah, uh, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. And 
and uh, David Allen and New York Gong is going to be the headliner for this festival. And the festival is going to be a 12 plus hour long event. Um, so there's a lot of bands involved, including, uh, including you and yours. Right. And, and I would like to get whatever memories you have of uh, the lead up to the festival and festival day. What can you tell me? I can't tell you much about the lead up to the festival. Okay. Um, I just knew we were going to do the show. So we brought, you know, knowing Glenn, we probably had at least two rehearsals that okay. week. <laughs> uh -huh. um, aside from that, I just remember that I like, I like the fact that the show was basically on second Avenue and what 13th street or 12th street. It was, it was basically yeah. right down the, the road from me. Oh, okay. So, you lived near there. Good. <laughs> yeah, I lived on 22nd and 1st, well, which was where Fun City was as well. So I was really close. Um, and so I went down there early and I guess watched as much of, the, of it as I could. Uh, you know, I remember there was a certain amount of chaos the day of the event. Sure. Whether people were showing up, who was going on, in what order. <laughs> is everyone from new york gone here is everyone from theoretical girls here <laughs> uh-huh right well that that brings up a good question about everyone from theoretical girls because uh this there seems to be uh different memories about you know who played uh and if the, if the theoretical girls band played as a band or if it was members of theoretical girls and if static played as a band or was it members of static what is your memory of this well my memory is that theoretical girls played okay um and you know i think the sets were relatively short you know i think we did u.s millie and you got me and i you know maybe a couple others uh-huh um, but I believe we were all there. Um, and do you I remember, mean, what, do you remember what the theater was like, the uh, audience? Well, the theater was fairly packed. <laughs> um, it was, it was a nice old New York theater. I remember that there was a big, a huge backstage area. So of course there were all musicians milling about everywhere. Uh -huh. And I guess Giorgio was back there. And, uh, you know, I do remember going up and checking out the recording at some point because that was obviously my thing. Sure. <laughs> so um, I, I remember them watching them do that. Do you, the, so the, the person who did sound for the entire event was Paul Sears, the drummer for the Muffins. Mm. Do you have any uh, words with him that you remember? I do not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so long ago. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, when I would go to a show, I would hang out and try and talk to everybody. That sure. <laughs> be I, there, this and that. So it's like trying to, to roll that tape back 40 years later. It's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me try some more. Uh, okay. Do you, do you remember uh, who played like before you and after you or any of the other bands that you saw that day? Well, I thought Rick Brown's band played right before us. Okay, that would have been a blinding headache. Yep. Or right after us. Right. <laughs> but but I, I, I think they were on right in that same, you know, within that same hour. Right. Um, I've had the day described to me as kind of like two groups of bands, almost like two different genres. The headliners tended to be from the progressive wing of the avant-garde, but the earlier bands in the day tended to be more the uh, art art rock avant-garde. I'm not sure exactly how would you describe it. Did first of all, did you did you kind of see that difference and how? Well, would you I mean, I, I think as I said, it's naturally when you're backstage, you sort of gravitate to people that you know. Right, right, and and so that's where it all starts. And there were definitely like two contingents there because there were the the Europeans and yeah. the 
you know, jazz aspect and then the, you know, New York people. Right. So, right. Um, you know, and it would have made sense as a promoter, I think, to do the New York stuff earlier. Right. And then do the other stuff later because hopefully you get your audience in there and then they stay to see people that, you know, they wouldn't have a chance to see otherwise. Sure. Sure. And uh, um, David Allen and Gong was just the name was probably the best known act anyway. So it made, yes. made sense to have them headline, of course. Fred Frith was also on the bill, but he didn't get on the poster, which makes me think he was kind of a late addition. Well, I mean, I don't think Theoretical Girls was on the poster either, was it? No, it is mentioned. But again, oh, it is mentioned? so the poster has uh, uh, names of people and then a band name next to those people. Uh, and again, not everybody in Theoretical Girls is mentioned on the poster. Would you, would, you, would you like me to show you the poster? Yeah, that would be interesting. All right, let me pull it up. All right, can you see that? Yes, I can. Uh, is it readable or do you want me to blow it up a yeah. little? No, I, I, I'm pretty good with it. So if you look down in the middle part of the poster, you can see Theoretical Girls in all caps. And actually, everybody in the, from the band is listed, it looks like. Glenn Branca, yeah. Jeff Lone, we're, Morton Tier, Margaret Deweese. Yeah, we're but, all listed. But the static is also listed next to Theoretical Girls, and no, but no name. Well, it's, yes, there are no names associated with that. Um, so do you, do you think the static played, or was it just because... Glenn was in both. I, I, I would say that, that Glenn probably got the static on at the end, near the end of the <laughs> filling everybody in. Uh huh. And maybe that's why they didn't include the names. Right. Or, you know, maybe Glenn didn't want the separate names, you know. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what to, because they're not all, I mean, Arsenal is also played, but I don't see any names listed there. Right. Who is Susan Russell? You got me. Okay. Well, I'm going to be talking to uh, Christine Hahn from the static. Uh, and Christine's good because she, she's got quite the memory. Good. Of, of a lot of this. All right. So as you peruse the names there on the poster, um, mm -hmm. Um, anything, any other memories from the festival uh, jump to mind here? Well, it was just, uh, I mean, I just, I was amazed that anyone could pull it off. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. I mean, Christine might have a better memory of some of that stuff. She's better with names than I am. Okay. Hey. She could probably t t tell you why the static didn't have their names listed as well. Right. Well, the poster, you know, there's only so much room on the poster. But to me, it was a kind of a bigger surprise that Fred Frith didn't get on it. Uh, since he was actually, people in New York especially knew who he was. And people knew Henry Cow. Uh, um, uh, Chris Cutler was also there at the festival. Sure. No, I remember him playing. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and he, he didn't get his name on either, which makes me think that, you know, they were kind of a, a late addition or maybe there was, you know, there was some work. I know Giorgio actually, you know, paid for them to fly over. And, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, knowing Giorgio, I mean, he was just kind of playing it out as it went. Sure. You know, right. and, and, and figuring what he could afford to do, you know, if he sold some right. tickets or whatever, he could add some people and do this. So, you know, I think he was doing that up to the last minute, which is probably why it was a little chaotic backstage and certain right. people wanted to go on in certain slots and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, the fact that Giorgio brings Fred Frith over to New York for this is kind of important for the rest of us in North America who are into improvised music because Fred Frith would stay. He would stay in uh, the New York area for a long time and end up uh, settling 
in uh, the U.S. for quite a while. And uh, Fred Frith is is uh, one of every everybody's favorite uh, improvising guitarist. Uh, not in just North America now, but of course all around the world. So to me, that's that was if that alone is why the Zoo Mana Festival I think is so important. Well, you know, so and, and he must have had a good time at it, or else you wouldn't have stayed, right? Right, <laughs> right, yeah. He must have he must have seen something there and said, "Yeah, I like this energy. I like you know." Yeah, that that's all I can imagine. I mean, New York did have a very cool energy at the time sure you know in that in that late 70s and i mean part of it was that you know the place was falling apart it seems but you know i guess that creates a little sense of uh, adventure or <laughs> yeah right <laughs> daring do or whatever i mean it, it would force artists out out there and you know so given all that energy and all these things that happened for you at, the, at that time, um, it clearly had a huge impact on what you would go on to do years later. When you look back at the no wave time, you know, that, that you had there and, and all these people and experiences, how do, you, how do you feel about it in terms of how it laid the groundwork for the rest of uh, the decades to come for you well i mean you know the, the the one thing that my early new york experience taught me was was how to get along with musicians uh -huh. yes that's a key and, and component it's it's a key component when you're in the studio with them to get them yeah. to actually just relax and play music you know right and uh you know i always felt that i was pretty good at that uh to the point of sometimes, I guess, starting the tape machine when I said, okay, we're just going to run through the first song so I could see what's going on. And then uh -huh. I would hit play. And then I would, afterwards, I would say, I think we got a good take. Come on in and hear it. And they would be like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, it is just getting people relaxed. And, and you know, when they, when the, when you say, you know, recording or the tapes rolling sometimes people just go oh. uh-huh right so th there is something to be said for get catching people unawares sure you started talking about um making musicians comfortable in the studio and mm -hmm. and you know this is what you learned right and this is exactly what eddie offered told me mm -hmm. you, you know i did an interview with eddie offered he was incredibly hard to, to find. I, I spent t over two years tracking him down. Wow. And, uh, but, but once I found him, he was so gracious. He, he, was, he was really into doing it. And uh, he worked with Giorgio. In fact, he credited Giorgio, you know, was kind of starting his career as a recording engineer. Oh, excellent. Because Giorgio uh, requested him at AdVision Studio um, to do some of the first... Uh, full full on recording up until then he was a tape op you know basically um so yes the the studio always had that kind of you know well first you first you get the coffee and you roll the tapes up uh huh yeah. then, you, then you're the tape op uh -huh. and then you get to do this and then you yeah, get right. to do that well, and you know i mean for City him was all 60s. just me you know that was, the... was all just me it was just yeah uh, right Right. But he, yeah, well, AdVision was a small operation when uh, pretty much throughout its entire time, you know, it was basically uh, three recording engineers and some assistants. Um, I don't think they ever had much more than that. But of course, I think Giorgio really helped. Well, Eddie, Eddie said Giorgio, you know, helped him to uh, work with musicians. Um, what he saw Giorgio do in the studio, you know, how he saw Giorgio relax musicians in the studio. And of course, Eddie makes a career out of that and ends up doing the same for Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. <laughs> uh, anyway, I thought you might be curious to see that interview since uh, you share that recording. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's fascinating to me. Uh, I, I, like, I like Yes too. Me too. Yeah, you know, I was I was a big Yes fan. I like sure. the double the double album. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, topogra- Tales from Topographic Oceans, I liked. I know that everyone loved to trash that, but I liked it. I, I, I used to play it when the ensemble was on tour and we would all be in the car together and I'd be driving it at, you know, one in the morning. Uh-huh. It would always be Tales of Topographic Oceans. <laughs> you know, my horn player would put on the headphones and start listening to something else, but... <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, and that's a that's another point I keep trying to make in the writing that I'm doing here is that uh, these genre ghettos that people like to, you know, be tribal well, about are, are yeah. really, they're myth. It's a myth. It is. It know? is a complete myth. And it's it's just, a, you know, the, people want to categorize something so that they, they pick a title and, and then, you you know, you're in. Right. But I, I know for a fact that Paige Hamilton was a big Genesis fan. Yeah, no, you know, I, I saw the name. So tell me about Paige Hamilton. Who I don't, I'm not familiar with him. Well, he was he was the, you know, the main person in Helmet. Okay, all right. And uh, I, I he played with Glenn. That's where I met him. Uh huh. Yeah. And he he studied music. Um, he was from Oregon originally. Uh huh. And he had studied guitar and he came to New York and he played with Glenn and then he, he pretty much started Helmet. And, and started his own music appreciation through Genesis. <laughs> well, I mean, it was definitely a part of it. And, and if you, you listen to some of the early, especially the early Helmet, yeah. you'll, you'll see little loops in there that are... Oh, interesting. Very Genesis-like. I mean, there's yeah. no, obviously no keyboards, but it's, it's more like a timing you know thing yeah. the, the the heavier aspect of genesis maybe if that's the fair way to put it you know huh i'm gonna take note of this because i'm working on a story about this topic uh, uh about how progressive rock you know got got such a bad rap but had a huge influence on well and, the- and, and and glenn bronk and i you know we connected because uh on over show tunes because both of our parents that was their that was our introduction to music. We both right. were like raised on show tunes. Right. You know, now with his theater background, maybe that made a little sense, but you know. Uh-huh. Did you know that, uh, you know, Keith Levine, the guitar player for Public Image Limited? Uh huh. Did you know he was a roadie for Yes? Uh, that makes sense. And he loves <laughs> Steve Howe's playing. Right. <laughs> I, I can believe it. It yeah. all makes sense to me. Yeah. So, so that addresses the recording engineer part of your career, but mm-hmm. you also uh, went on to form more bands and write. Oh, right, and right. A heck more music. Of music. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've always loved music, you know, and and it's it's almost like I I'm, I'm fascinated by all the genres and and you know, love put, putting my stamp on whatever one I can put my foot into, uh-huh. if that makes sense. Sure. Um, but you were also doing, um, uh, you continued to write music that was dense, you know. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm also part of the mass guitar uh, choir, I guess, in, in a uh-huh. way, because right. when I wanted to play again um, after quite a period of just pretty much recording. And, and you know, I, I kind of stopped playing with five bands and just concentrated on recording for many years uh but in the mid 90s i said you know i really want to go out and play again i think that's why all this started and i have to get back to that um i started a multi-guitar band you know four or five guitarists sax Uh bass and drums that was uh you know my symphonic surf band and what was that called uh the wharton tears ensemble okay and uh, it, it pretty much continues to this day. We're, we're still officially uh, intact, I guess. It's the best way to describe it now. Uh-huh. Great. Well, it sounds like uh, for you and myself, too, once you dip your toe into this multi-guitar army dense, loud sound, there's something about it that <laughs> makes you want more. And uh, I, I just love going to live shows that have that sound. Right. Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, 
I mean, for one thing, at least at least you're assured that the guitars will be loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> which, which, uh, you know, I, I mean, I've been to some venues up here in Pennsylvania, and I, I always feel like they need some sound people up here to, to tell them how to mix rock and roll. Uh -huh. You know, because they always make the vocals way too loud. Right. And, and the band kind of sits in the background. Right. And as a musician, you know, it just doesn't, it's not the way I like hearing music, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Well, you and I have been hearing music for a long time now, and uh, we know what we like. That's true. And, uh, fortunately, I can still find it. Um, Wharton, thank you very much for spending time with me. And All right. I love these stories uh, of those early New York days. Um, a very will... fascinating time. Did, did you check out Blank City? I did, yes. And, you know, I had seen it before, but I watched it again because right. uh, I, I wanted to... Uh, and the, uh, the A-Band song is the closer. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's my song that, that rolls over the credits at the end. Yeah. Uh, for people who are not aware, Blank City is a, a, a kind of a documentary film about the no-wave time, but it focuses on the film people who were making films because filmmakers were a big part of the no wave scene too. It wasn't just yeah, absolutely. Uh, it? Well, it was it was all arts, all, all, arts, all yeah. artistic discipline. I think all fed into that. So right. film and and performance art and you know music and yep. All right, Warden. Thank you very okay. much. We'll talk Sounds again. Good. Sounds good.